podcast. The podcast we did on COMT is the fourth most clicked on our entire website. So that's a pretty interesting fact. So you can see how uh, the level of interest and how interesting Dr. Becker is. So welcome back, my friend. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much. I love your podcast, but apparently I have to up my game. You've had somebody on your show four times and it wasn't me. I know. I'm telling you. <laughs> well, you, you'll you you'll wiggle your way there. She, it's actually Julianne Carnes, and she's just a really – she just has a lot of great stuff about, like, goal setting and abundance, and she – she always finds her way back onto the podcast. Uh, Dr. Mike has a, forged a really great friendship with her. But you're on a very, gotcha. very, very short short list. So here's, <laughs> here's Dr. Becker's bio. She's an integrated physician practicing for over 10 years. She is Connecticut's 4A specialist, 4A meaning asthma, autism, allergies, and atopy eczema. She holds a naturopathic degree and an MS in advanced practicing RN. She's very smarty pants. She's board certified in both areas. Her specialties include MTHFR, fertility, and the treatment of the four A's. Dr. Becker focuses primarily treating the pediatric population and their parents. Dr. Becker is an adjunct faculty at two prominent universities where she teaches to physicians and precept student doctors and nurse practitioners. Dr. Becker, Le Becker lectures all over the country on topics such as autism, the immune system, MTHFR, and genetic mutations that have health implications and keeping healing, wait, yep, and keeping healing and health in the home. Jeez, sorry about that. Dr. Becker, no worries. author of A Delicious Way to Heal the Gut, and released her second book, All You Can Eat, in May 2018. Dr. Becker was chosen as one of Connecticut's top naturopathic doctors and 10 best APRNs. Dr. Becker, you know, inflammation is an extremely common touch point on our podcast. We always swing back around because it is so important. It's so prevalent. Inflammation is a root cause of most illnesses, and it hit the mainstream sometime in the 1980s when it was on the front of the Time magazine, uh, and our understanding of inflammation has only grown. So let's take a dive into inflammation nation. And this is where I want to start off, Doc. Can you explain the difference, because uh, they're really important, the difference between chronic inflammation and acute inflammation and the relevance of both? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so the let's start with acute inflammation. That's something that we want and is beneficial to healing, right? So say you sprain an ankle, you're walking down the street and you roll your ankle. What happens? You end up with a ton of swelling in that area. And why is that? Because that area now needs to rest. And the and if you were to use your ankle or your foot, then you're going to have some pain. So the swelling protects the area. It brings blood flow, oxygen, and a whole bunch of healing um, enzymes to that area so that the body can start to heal itself. So that is a natural physiologic process that we want to happen, uh, you know, as often as we need it. I mean, I hope you're not chronically spraining your ankles, but nonetheless, it is, is a protective mechanism that exists exist throughout the body. So chronic inflammation, as you mentioned, is really a whole different subset with a whole different, uh, you know, I guess, load of pathophysiology in the sense that it's kind of like um, a good way to describe it is it's kind of like a blister. So if you have a blister, um, you pop the blister. Well, you're not supposed to, but I'm a doctor, so I do. And then you put a Band-Aid on it and the Band-Aid heals. But if you leave that blister alone and it rubs against the in inside of your shoe, it continues to cause pain and continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you let that blister, um, you don't do anything to cultivate the healing and you let that blister kind of fester, what happens over a long period of time is you actually have physiologic changes in that tissue. So the same thing happens with all of the tissue throughout our whole body, depending on where the inflammation is. So let's just talk about the gut, for example, right? So um, we'll use the example of food allergies. So say you are somebody who has a food allergy to something like gluten. And we are not talking about that food, the type of food allergy that you ingest a food and within 15 minutes your throat closes and you go into anaphylaxis. This is a different kind of food allergy. This is what we call delayed hypersensitivity, meaning you can have uh, an, an ingestion or a contact with something that your body is sensitive to, but you may not develop symptoms for up to 72 hours hours later. 
The problem is, is if you're eating something that you're developing symptoms to, but you're not exactly identifying what it is, your body creates that same inflammation that you get when you swell your ankle when you roll it walking down the sidewalk. If it is not identified or uh, de dealt with by the organism, that becomes chronic inflammation and a couple of things can happen. Number one, we know that healing doesn't happen. Number two, sometimes the immune system gets mis directed and starts to hyper focus on that particular area of the gut and can kind of, you know, lay the foundation for autoimmune diseases and a, and a ton of other problems. Or the other problem is, is that then you start your inflammation cells and enzymes start recruiting other uh, factors in the gut creating further and um, more profound food allergies and food sensitivities or cross reactivities. So it's definitely something that you want to deal with. The same process can go on in your thyroid. It certainly can go on in your brain and it can go on in, in all of your other organs. And that was just kind of a, because I deal folk and focus a lot on gut healing, a nice succinct way to talk about it. Right now <clears throat> we're going to dive into a lot about food. I mean, that's going to be our prime focus today. But before we just dive in there, are there other triggers for inflammation other than food that, you know, people should just be aware of that we can touch upon? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wi-Fi is a big one. Mm, you I know, thought, I thought it, you were going to say that. Yep. Yeah, especially if, you know, you have a particular genetic makeup with MTHFR and COMP-T genes and some of the other genes that are really um, – designed to create enzymes to help the body detox. So, you know, this whole 5G rollout, you know, here in Connecticut, you know, our governor loves 5G, you know, because he's going to have his pockets lined when they when they load up the 5G. And so people are very concerned about their health, you know, with regard to 5G, you know, the pulsing of the Wi-Fi that goes on in everybody's house um, can actually kind of create and set the scene for something like a mast cell activation disorder, which is just a constant ping and trigger on your cell membrane that is going to irritate your cells and cause it to swell up and create inflammation. So yeah, so Wi-Fi is a big one. Certainly environmental toxins like pesticides and, and smelly chemicals that we find inside our home and things like that. But those things, I, you know, I really feel like humans are much better at managing, you know, getting smelly chemicals out of their home or making sure they're not living in an area that's that's intensely polluted. But, you know, some of our common creature comforts, I think, are minimized as as not being as toxic as they are because we all want to have Wi-Fi 24-7, 365, and we don't realize that there can be an implication on ourselves for sure yeah the, the tricky thing with wi-fi and, and like many other things is, is that it affects every single individual so differently and it makes it that makes it really challenging really challenging absolutely absolutely but so what i tell my patients is you know first of all most of us have kids that have too much screen time anyway so right. you just shut the wi-fi off you know start with shutting the wi-fi off at night like nobody needs the wi-fi at night you should all be sleeping and then you kind of figure out what your family patterns are. And, you know, you, you buy one of those little pin clocks or, you know, some sort of a timer and you put that on your Wi-Fi and you have your Wi-Fi on like two hours a day. You know, most of us work full time jobs, have kids that are out of the house. And so it's not like you have this constant need to have, you know, exposure to the Wi-Fi or to the Internet because you're really only using it two or three hours a day anyway. Right. 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 Challenging, but definitely, definitely definitely possible um, I, I would assume most schools now are just totally getting blasted the kids all day with wi-fi as well i would assume oh. that's pretty much ubiquitous right Oh, absolutely. And actually, here's a nice little interesting caveat. Years ago, this kid now I think is in junior high, but years ago I had a little sensory kid that came into my office and he was fine at home, but he used to kind of stim in front of the dishwasher. So the mother was really mindful about that. They pulled out the dishwasher, they insulated it, and it reduced the stim at home. So the kid was fine at home. So then what happened was over time, they realized he was really struggling in school and he would stand up from his desk and do some of those like hand flapping movements that you see in the autistic population. So I, I said to the mother, I was like, well, what is it about the classroom? She's like, I don't know. He sits near the window, this, there, and that. Well, we went through everything. Well, it turns out the Wi-Fi um, modem for that classroom was literally over that poor kid's desk. And that was what was causing the stimulation in, you know, in this particular classroom. So we moved his classroom, we moved his desk, and really he wasn't even on the radar as far as having any special needs or, or even, you know, any kind of special concerns going forward. But he, in that case, was very, very sensitive. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I have a lot of interest in uh, Dr. Mercola's new book that's being released. You know, it's all about 5G and EMF. It's it's um. Oh boy, I don't know. We could have that convers. We could have that full conversation another another day. I know it's he- that's he- that's some heavy stuff. My favorite book is uh the tinfoil hat guide uh to e- the non tinfoil hat guide to EMFs and and uh, Wi-Fi toxicity. That's a good one too. Oh, that's it's actually a good good read in spite of the fact that it's full of a ton of studies. Yeah, I, I notice now they they have like men's underwear that protects from EMS and and. Uh, cats that you can wear i mean it's getting it's getting pretty interesting i'm telling you it's really an interesting topic but we'll uh we'll we'll come back around to that topic another day for sure so let's let's swing back around to food Uh, you mentioned one of them from your perspective doc what are the most inflammatory foods gluten dairy corn and soy and sugar but sugar's kind of in its own separate category for a bunch of different reasons. But as far, so when you talk about food sensitivities, of course, you're talking about protein, right? Right. So you look at the gluten protein that comes from wheat, you look at the corn protein that comes from corn, you look at the casein protein that comes from dairy, and that's processed in commercial dairy, which is a little bit different than raw dairy, and the soy protein that comes from soy. The corn is very, very acidic. Uh, Soy is really not something that humans should consume really in any form. Form. I mean, there's a lot of traditional use of fermented soy in Asian countries, and clearly the fermentation process breaks down a lot of the protein, so it's something that can be digestible for some humans to consume. Dairy, uh, we have just completely damaged what we've done to dairy, and, and humans are the only animal, the only mammal, that wean their young off their own milk to put them on the milk of another animal. I mean, it's, it's something that just goes against all, you know, concepts in, in nature. I understand, um, you know, I, I don't know if you know this uh noah but it's illegal to talk bad about milk in 13 states in this country 